This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, and to find out how you could volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter The Prisoner of Zender by Anthony Hope Chapter Twenty: The Prisoner and the King In order to have a full understanding of what had occurred in the castle of Zender, it is necessary to supplement my account of what I myself saw and did on that night by relating briefly what I afterwards learnt from Fritz and from Madame de Maubin. The story told by the latter explained clearly how it happened that the cry which I had arranged as a stratagem and a sham had come in dreadful reality before its time, and had thus, as it seemed at the moment, ruined our hopes, while in the end it had favoured them. The unhappy woman, fired, I believe, by a genuine attachment to the Duke of Strelsau, no less than by the dazzling prospects which a dominion over him opened before her eyes, had followed him at his request from Paris to Ruritania. He was a man of strong passions, but of stronger will, and his cool head ruled both. He was content to take all and give nothing. When she arrived, she was not long in finding that she had a rival in the Princess Flavia. Rendered desperate, she stood at nothing which might give or keep for her her power over the Duke. As I say, he took and gave not. Simultaneously, Antoinette found herself entangled in his audacious schemes. Unwilling to abandon him, but bound to him by the chains of shame and hope, yet she would not be a decoy, nor, at his bidding, lure me to death. Hence the letters of warning she had written. Whether the lines she sent to Flavia were inspired by good or bad feeling, by jealousy or by pity, I do not know. But here also she served us well. When the Duke went to Zender she accompanied him, and here, for the first time, she learnt the full measure of his cruelty, and was touched with compassion for the unfortunate king. From this time she was with us. Yet, from what she told me, I know that she still, as women will, loved Michael, and trusted to gain his life, if not his pardon, from the king, as the reward for her assistance. His triumph she did not desire, for she loathed his crime, and loathed yet more fiercely what would be the prize of it his marriage with his cousin, Princess Flavia. At Zender new forces came into play, the lust and daring of young Rupert. He was caught by her beauty, perhaps. Perhaps it was enough for him that she belonged to another man, and that she hated him. For many days there had been quarrels and ill-will between him and the Duke, and the scene which I had witnessed in the Duke's room was but one of many. Rupert's proposals to me— of which she had, of course, been ignorant, in no way surprised her when I related them. She had herself warned Michael against Rupert, even when she was calling on me to deliver her from both of them. On this night, then, Rupert had determined to have his will. When she had gone to her room, he, having furnished himself with a key to it, had made his entrance. Her cries had brought the Duke, and there, in the dark room, while she screamed, the men had fought and Rupert, having wounded his master with a mortal blow, had, on the servants rushing in, escaped through the window, as I have described. The Duke's blood, spurting out, had stained his opponent's shirt, but Rupert, not knowing that he had dealt Michael his death, was eager to finish the encounter. How he meant to deal with the other three of the band I know not. I dare say he did not think, for the killing of Michael was not premeditated. Antoinette, left alone with the Duke, had tried to staunch his wound, and thus was she busied till he died, and then, hearing Rupert's taunts, she had come forth to avenge him. Me she had not seen, nor did she, till I darted out of my ambush, and left after Rupert into the moat. The same moment found my friends on the scene. They had reached the chateau in due time, and waited ready by the door. But Johann, swept with the rest to the rescue of the Duke, did not open it. Nay, he took a part against Rupert, putting himself forward more bravely than any in his anxiety to avert suspicion, and he had received a wound in the embrasure of the window. Till nearly half-past two, Zapt waited, 
Then, following my orders, he had sent Fritz to search the banks of the moat. I was not there. Hastening back, Fritz told Zapt, and Zapt was for following orders still, and riding at full speed back to Tarlenheim, while Fritz would not hear of abandoning me, let me have ordered what I would. On this they disputed some few minutes. Then Zapt, persuaded by Fritz, detached a party under Bernenstein to gallop back to Tarlenheim and bring up the marshal, while the rest fell to on the great door of the chateau. For several minutes it resisted them. Then, just as Antoinette de Maubin fired at Rupert Hentzau on the bridge, they broke in, eight of them in all, and the first door they came to was the door of Michael's room, and Michael lay dead across the threshold, with a sword thrust through his breast. Zapp cried out at his death, as I had heard, and they rushed on to the servants. But these, in fear, dropped their weapons, and Antoinette flung herself weeping at Zapp's feet, and all she cried was that I had been at the end of the bridge, and had leapt off. "'What of the prisoner?' asked Zapt. But she shook her head. Then Zapt and Fritz, with the gentleman behind them, crossed the bridge, slowly, warily, and without noise and Fritz stumbled over the body of de Gauthier in the way of the door. They felt him, and found him dead. Then they consulted, listening eagerly for any sound from the cells below. But there came none, and they were greatly afraid that the king's guards had killed him, and, having pushed his body through the great pipe, had escaped the same way themselves. Yet, because I had been seen here, they had still some hope. Thus, indeed, Fritz, in his friendship, told me, and going back to Michael's body, pushing aside Antoinette, who prayed by it, they found a key to the door which I had locked, and opened the door. The staircase was dark, and they would not use a torch at first, lest they should be the more exposed to fire. But soon Fritz cried, "'The door down there is open. See, there is light.' So they went on boldly, and found none to oppose them. And when they came to the outer room, and saw the Belgian, Bersonin, lying dead, they thanked God, zapped, saying, Ay, he has been here. Then, rushing into the king's cell, they found Dechar lying dead across the dead physician, and the king on his back with his chair by him. And Fritz cried, He's dead! And Zap drove all out of the room except Fritz, and knelt down by the king. And, having learnt more of wounds and the signs of death than I, he soon knew that the king was not dead, nor, if properly attended, would die and they covered his face, and carried him to Duke Michael's room, and laid him there. And Antoinette rose from praying by the body of the Duke, and went to bathe the King's head and dress his wounds, till a doctor came. And Zapt, seeing I had been there, and having heard Antoinette's story, sent Fritz to search the moat and then the forest. He dared send no one else. And Fritz found my horse, and feared the worst. Then, as I have told, he found me— guided by the shout with which I had called on Rupert to stop and face me, and I think a man has never been more glad to find his own brother alive than was Fritz to come on me, so that in love and anxiety for me he thought nothing of a thing so great as would have been the death of Rupert Hentzau. Yet, had Fritz killed him, I should have grudged it. The enterprise of the King's rescue being thus prosperously concluded— it lay on Colonel Zapt to secure secrecy as to the King ever having been in need of rescue. Antoinette de Maubin and Johann the Keeper, who indeed was too much hurt to be wagging his tongue just now, were sworn to reveal nothing, and Fritz went forth to find, not the King, but the unnamed friend of the King, who had lain in Zender and flashed for a moment before the dazed eyes of Duke Michael's servants on the drawbridge. The metamorphosis had happened, and the king, wounded almost to death by the attacks of the jailers who guarded his friend, had at last overcome them, and rested now, wounded but alive, in Black Michael's own room in the castle. There he had been carried, his face covered with a cloth from the cell, and orders issued that if his friend were found he should be brought directly and privately to the king, and that meanwhile messengers should ride at full speed to Tarlenheim, to tell Marshal Strakentz to assure the princess of the king's safety, and to come himself with all speed to greet the king. The princess was enjoined to remain at Tarlenheim, and there await her cousin's coming, or his further injunctions. Thus the king would come to his own again, having wrought brave deeds, and escaped almost by a miracle the treacherous assault of his unnatural brother. 
This ingenious arrangement of my long-headed old friend prospered in every way, save where it encountered a force that often defeats the most cunning schemes. I mean nothing else than the pleasure of a woman. For let her cousin and sovereign send what command he chose, or Colonel Zapp chose for him, and let Marshal Strakentz insist as he would, the Princess Flavia was in no way minded to rest at Tarlenheim, while her lover lay wounded at Zender, and when the Marshal, with a small suite, rose forth from Tarlenheim on the way to Zender, the Princess's carriage followed immediately behind, and in this order they passed through the town where the report was already rife that the King, going the night before to remonstrate with his brother in all friendliness, for that he held one of the King's friends in confinement in the castle, had been most traitorously set upon, that there had been a desperate conflict, that the Duke was slain with several of his gentlemen, and that the King, wounded as he was, had seized and held the castle of Zender. All of which talk made, as may be supposed, a mighty excitement, and the wires were set in motion, and the tidings came to Strelsau, only just after orders had been sent thither to parade the troops, and over all the dissatisfied quarters of the town with a display of force. Thus the Princess Flavia came to Zender, and as she drove up the hill with the marshal riding by the wheel, and still imploring her to return in obedience to the king's orders, Fritz von Talenheim, with the prisoner of Zender, came to the edge of the forest. I had revived from my swoon, and walked, resting on Fritz's arm, and looking out from the cover of the trees I saw the princess. Suddenly understanding from a glance at my companion's face that we must not meet her, I sank on my knees behind a clump of bushes. But there was one whom we had forgotten, but who had followed us, and was not disposed to let slip the chance of earning a smile and maybe a crown or two. And while we lay hidden, the little farm-girl came by us, and ran to the princess, curtsying and crying, "'Madame, the king is here, in the bushes. May I guide you to him, madame?' "'Nonsense, child,' said old Strakens. "'The king lies wounded in the castle.' "'Yes, sir, he's wounded, I know, but he's there, with Count Fritz, and not at the castle,' she persisted. "'Is he in two places, or rather two kings?' asked Flavia, bewildered. "'And how should he be here?' "'He pursued a gentleman, madame, and they fought till Count Fritz came, "'and the other gentleman took my father's horse from me and rode away. "'But the king is here with Count Fritz. "'Why, madame, is there another man in Ruritania like the king?' "'No, my child,' said Flavia softly. "'I was told it afterwards. "'And she smiled and gave the girl money. "'I will go and see this gentleman.' "'And she rose to alight from the carriage.' But at this moment Zapt came riding from the castle, and seeing the princess, made the best of a bad job, and cried to her that the king was well tended and in no danger. "'In the castle?' she asked. "'Where else, madame?' said he, bowing. "'But this girl says he is yonder with Count Fritz.' Zapt turns his eyes on the child with an incredulous smile. "'Every fine gentleman is a king to such,' said he. "'Why, he's as like the king as one pea to another, madame,' cried the girl, a little shaken, but still obstinate. Zapt started round. The old marshal's face asked unspoken questions. Flavia's glance was no less eloquent. Suspicion spreads quick. "'I'll ride myself and see this man,' said Zapt hastily. "'Nay, I'll come myself,' said the princess. "'Then come alone,' he whispered and she, obedient to the strange hinting in his face, prayed the marshal and the rest to wait, and she and Zapt came on foot towards where we lay, Zapt waving to the farm-girl to keep at a distance. And when I saw them coming, I sat in a sad heap on the ground, and buried my face in my hands. I could not look at her. Fritz knelt by me, laying his hand on my shoulder. "'Speak low, whatever you say,' I heard Zapt whisper as they came up and the next thing I heard was a low cry, half of joy, half of fear, from the princess. "'It is he! Are you hurt?' And she fell on the ground by me, and gently pulled my hands away, but I kept my eyes to the ground. "'It is the king,' she said. "'Pray, Colonel Zapp, tell me where lay the wit of the joke you played on me?' We answered none of us. We three were silent before her. 
Regardless of them, she threw her arms round my neck and kissed me. Then Zapt spoke in a low, hoarse whisper. "'It is not the king. Don't kiss him. He is not the king.' She drew back for a moment. Then, with an arm still round my neck, she asked in superb indignation, "'Do I not know my love? Rudolf, my love!' "'It is not the king,' said old Zapt again, and a sudden sob broke from tender-hearted Fritz. It was the sob that told her no comedy was afoot. "'He is the king,' she cried. "'It is the king's face, the king's ring, my ring. It is my love.' "'Your love, madame,' said old Zapt, "'but not the king. The king is there in the castle. This gentleman—' "'Look at me! Rudolf, look at me!' she cried, taking my face between her hands. "'Why do you let them torment me? Tell me what it means!' Then I spoke, gazing into her eyes. "'God forgive me, madame,' I said. "'I am not the king.' I felt her hands clutch my cheeks. She gazed at me as never man's face was scanned yet. And I, silent again, saw wonder born, and doubt grow— and terror spring to life as she looked, and very gradually the grasp of her hand slackened. She turned to Zapt, to Fritz, and back to me. Then suddenly she reeled forward and fell in my arms, and with a great cry of pain I gathered her to me and kissed her lips. Zapt laid his hand on my arm. I looked up in his face, and I laid her softly on the ground and stood up, looking on her, cursing heaven that young Rupert's sword had spared me for this sharper pang. End of chapter 20